Um, I think that communities should be looking um, to themselves, to understanding their history, to understanding where the inherent right comes from. Um, it wasn't granted by the federal government. It wasn't granted by any government. It exists by right of prior occupation. The indigenous nations were here in the, in the space now known as Canada prior to the arrival of the Europeans. They were independent, sovereign nations at the time of a sort of European arrival. And that's where the inherent right comes from. I think there's a, a real need to sort of educate communities and, and their citizens and populations, their membership, on what the inherent right actually is and where it comes from. Uh, I mean, all communities really um, uh, already have an inherent right to govern them, their, their communities, uh, built on their cultures and their languages and traditions. And uh, a lot of that has been uh, somewhat um, driven underground, if you will, or sometimes almost forgotten about well, I think they have to go back to their uh, to their roots and uh, and try and learn and understand how uh, it was done uh, by uh, those nations uh, in the earlier days before uh, the colonial era. Uh, I mean, uh, there, there were in this territory uh, solid nations with uh, sophisticated governance regimes that were basically destroyed by colonialism and uh, bad government policy over the last 400 years. How do they implement it? First of all, I think that there needs to be an understanding of just what that is. And the, I think the, the best way of, of explaining that in our language is and it's, um, it is, might be interpreted as being the natural law. And it is what, what we as Kutunaka people, the, the stewardship and the mandate that we were given when we were put on our land to, um, to protect our land and that's that's where inherent right comes from that's what it is to us and so how do you go about doing that how do you protect the land the people the language and culture that's how you implement inherent right because that's what it is it's it's protecting who you are as a people I think uh, no, you cannot create good governance regimes let's say for by copying from uh, from school books or university books or whatnot. I think you got to go back and understand who you are and then put in place the instruments that correspond to your values, to your traditions, and, and to, 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 to your vision. Uh, and, I, and I think that's a long haul and this requires a lot of work and, and a lot of assistance. So th how, do you, how do you go through that change? Is first of all, before you can change, you have to understand where you're at and you have to understand where you're going to be going to and why you're making that change. So I think that that's really, that those are the steps that we need to build on, is the, um, of why we're making that change and what that change will be. It's important to, to achieve governance as an overall objective by making sure that people feel that it's attainable and uh, one of the ways to do that of course is to uh, break it down um, just step by step so that um, it doesn't seem so huge and so impossible to achieve uh, if you look at it um, small steps at a time. Um, and so I think that uh, just asserting and practicing it and working on it within your own community is really sort of uh, I'd say the key in terms of uh, establishing an inherent right to self-government. If you're waiting for someone to give it to you or to negotiate or to, you know, then uh, you're, you're basically working on a delegated model. If you establish it through your own community process with your own people and start practicing it, then I'd say you're, you're effectively acting as if you've got the inherent right, which means you've got the inherent right. I think a lot of communities are starting to um, um, explore that, um, talk about it and, and try to reconcile their traditional forms with some of these modern institutions like a chief and council structure or maybe even a board uh, structure as well. So the example that I like to think about is Pemichikamek, which is the former Cross Lake First Nation in northern Manitoba. Uh, they've been in a struggle with Manitoba Hydro and refused to sign an implementation agreement. And as a part of that, in 1999, they developed, uh, in their own process, they developed a first written law. And uh, then they established their own four council system, uh, elders council, youth council, women's council, and executive council. So the existing band council structure is embedded within that, but they're running their own thing. 
and I liked it. The, the chief there now is John Muswagen. He says uh, when he's talking to Indian Affairs on the phone, once in a while they'll say to him, you know, we don't really recognize your system. And he'd said, that's fine, because uh, I don't really recognize your system either. So. Um